Hello my goblins and ghouls, my name is Steven. It is Sunday morning at 8.10 and I am going into the office because I need to make a jig today and I need to do it in one day. If you're new here, a couple years ago I started a project on an open source pick and place machine which automatically assembles electronic components onto circuit boards. And then I started a company selling them. If you want to start from the beginning, you can click here to catch up. Hello office. Okay, so what is this jig even supposed to do? So we are about to ship feeders, which are these little gizmos that move component tape really precisely so the pick and place machine can pick up all the parts in them. And when the feeder drops onto the rail of the Lumen PMP, it drops onto this little guy, which is called a slot. The slot gives the feeder communication and power, but it also has a little memory chip on it. And this memory chip has to be programmed with the number slot that it is. And this is really cool because when you drop the feeder onto the front rail, it knows exactly where it is. It talks to the little memory chip, it asks what address it's at, and then it knows exactly where it is on the machine. And that makes setup a ton easier. The problem is we need to program all of these memory chips. And right now the only way to do it is this old feeder prototype that I have where you can like program them in binary by clicking up and the addresses go all the way up to 50. So you have to click all the way up and program. It's a huge pain in the butt. So today we need to make a jig that's able to program an entire panel of slot PCBs. Wow. And right up there, those little guys, that's the EEPROM chip that we need to program. I'm actually about to go live on Twitch to start designing this thing live, but first here's the general idea about what I'm thinking about. So it'll be a little base station, and inside this base station is actually gonna be one of the feeder PCBs, one of the motherboards that controls a feeder. I have already written the code that programs these little EEPROM chips, and it already is ready to run on that feeder PCB, so why reinvent the wheel? Let's just use that board to do the programming too. And then there's gonna be a little cable connecting to a stylus, and on that stylus is gonna have some little springy pogo pins, and a button. So you can just hold those spring pins against the gold plated pads on the slot PCB, press the button and bam, it's just gonna program the EEPROM. I also wanna put a little screen on it so it will tell you what address it's about to program and like maybe give error codes or some other stuff like that. But I want it to be really clear what address you're about to program onto the EEPROM. And that'll make sure it's easy to match up that address with the little number on the silk screen of the PCB. Okay, I'm gonna go live and get going and we're gonna make this thing. So the very first thing that needs to happen is getting the prints running. I imported the feeder PCB into FreeCAD and fleshed out a little base station. The feeder already has two buttons so I just oriented the boards so they're accessible from the front of the base and we can just use them to change the address. Then I was adding a couple openings for the power plug in the back and the connector on the front for the stylus cable to plug into. Then I imported a little OLED screen model to figure out where that's going to go and I made a quick little model for the stylus too. It just really needs to have a connector on the back side and a modified slot PCB on the other to hold the spring pins at the right spacing. I got them sliced up in Prusa Slicer and sent them over to a couple Prusa Minis in our print farm. The frame that we just designed, printing in this blue. And then this is the stylus printing in this black. While those are running, I started in on some bodge wires. I really just had to add a couple wires for the I2C display and then a few more to a connector for the stylus. I used really small enamel wire for this so I can just patch them into individual pins on the microcontroller. After a quick boot test and no magic smoke, we are good to move on to the code. All the code for programming the EEPROM itself was already written, I just had to rearrange some stuff so the address auto increments and changes with the buttons and displays on the screen, but I could not get the screen to work so I just decided to sign off and debug it on my own. It's been a few months, and now we have shipped feeders and have actually been using this jig, but pretty much after I finished that stream, I just cranked the rest of the day, and I actually got it working by the end of the day. I ran into a bug where the I2C library was like connected to uh, different I2C pins on the microcontroller, so I figured that out, and I soldered those to different pins, and I got the screen working. The screen was a real pain in the butt. And also the graphics library takes up like 85% of the storage, the flash storage on the chip, because we don't need a really big chip on the feeder. We just need enough to be able to do some communication, drive some motors, check some uh, encoder pins. That's really it. So cramming that library onto that chip was wicked hard. I had to like remove a bunch of little chunks of code just to get the, the final compiled binary just small enough to fit. But anyway, let's take a look at the final product. This very much was a one day build. There's a lot of things I want to improve about this, but it does work. This is the base station. This is the very first uh, thing that we did that we designed this blue base and the screen right there, along with the two buttons for the feeder. So the feeder board is mounted right here on the inside. I left a little programming header out so I could put new code to it pretty easily. And then on the front is the ports going out to the stylus. And then here is the stylus, this black print with the spring pins on the end. And then there's just a little limit switch. 
As Bryce says, it thocks, and that tells the microcontroller in the feeder PCB to try and program. Now, originally I was just planning on having this one connector going out to the stylus, but I realized that if we're already gonna take every single slot and take this thing and jam it on there to program it, we might as well also check for shorts. So I added a secondary cable that goes to just different GPIO pins on the, the main controller board. And I added spring pins for all of the pads and it actually goes through before it programs and it checks to make sure that none of them are connected to each other. So it does all that checking automatically. It makes sure that everything is actually soldered correctly too. So we added that whole new feature to it after the fact. So let's boot it up. There we go. So there you can see it says one because that's the current address it's set to and ready, meaning it's ready to try and program. So if I just tap the button on the stylus, it says error, error program, because there was nothing to actually program. It didn't see any shorts because nothing's connected to it. I don't have this on a slot, but it couldn't program it. The programming failed and it stays at one because you haven't programmed one yet. Now if I actually do program, so I'm just gonna take these pins and line them up with all the pads on this first one and tap the button and it says one success. This is really hard to juggle all this. Oh, I'll just treat it like a parrot. <laughs> wow, that actually kind of works, okay. Wow, this is so precarious, <laughs> but it does work, okay. So now I'm gonna program the first one and you can see it says one success. And then it goes to two automatically because you don't wanna have to click up the address every single time after you're done. It should, if it's successfully programmed, it knows the next one you're gonna program is two if you're doing a whole panel, which is the only time we're ever doing this. And I can go to two, try and program it. Two success, goes to three. And for some reason, if you have to program a specific one, you can always tap up and change the address. And after you get to 50, it actually rolls over. 48, 49, 50, and then it rolls back to one. So you can never program it to an address that we don't actually need to program it to. And you can just bang through this. Now there's still a couple things that I wanna change about this. This does work really well, but something that I really want is some kind of auditory feedback that it was successful. Because what happens is every single time you program, you have to glance up at the screen to make sure that it actually programs successfully, which I kind of like, because it forces you to have to look every single time to check for an error. But on the other side of things, it'd be really nice if you just heard a beep for a successful one, because that's what happens 99.9% .9 of the time. And then if you don't hear the beep or you hear a different beep, you then you look up and you check to make sure. I'm just worried that if we're not constantly checking the screen, there's a much higher probability that we're gonna program an address wrong or something like that. So I'm not really sure about what I wanna do there, but it wouldn't be too hard to bodge in a little buzzer. There's a lot of benefit to just making a quick and dirty prototype for a jig like this, because if you spend a ton of time building it out exactly fully fleshed out, fully featured, you might not be building what's actually the most useful and what the best thing is for solving the problem that you have. For example, if I spent a ton of time designing a custom PCB for this whole jig and spent all this time on it, and then I realized, wait, I could also be checking for shorts. Then I have to bodge this precious thing I spent all the time on. This works great and we could use this indefinitely, but the fact that it's a nice quick and dirty prototype means I can just bodge in a couple other features like the buzzer, like checking for shorts. And then after it's kind of hit steady state and I see, okay, this is really what this jig should be. Then I can design the nice finish cleaned up one from scratch. So this is very quickly approaching that like kind of steady state, maybe a couple other little features bodged in right at the end. And then once I'm really happy with the feature set and like the functionality, then I can do a clean sweep and just make it from the beginning nice and easy. Speaking of which, would you like to see my crimes on the inside of this box? It is a one day bill, that's what I'll say about it. I had a teacher in high school who always said, if it's stupid and it works, it's not stupid. And I think that's true to a point. <laughs> so the first thing you'll see is this big block here. This is actually one of the motors on the head of the lumen that rotates the left or right nozzle. The reason this is here is for weight. If you have this base unit and it's just a print with a PCB in it, it's so light and you try and move around your stylus, it's dragging all over the place. It doesn't stay put. So we realized pretty quickly we had to put a weight in it to kind of keep it in place along with some rubber feet on the bottom and that keeps it right where it needs to be. But then you can see the screen with a couple jumper wires and then those bodge into the I2C -C pins inside. There's also a ton of enamel wire connecting everything together. A couple bodge wires going to the power jack in the back. And of course, a lot of hot glue and some bodge wires holding these connectors that are on the front going to the stylus back to all of the appropriate pins on the back in the PCB. But it really is just a feeder PCB, bunch of bodge wires, 
you can just click the buttons on the front and a screen. And that's pretty much it. So anyway, the main thesis here is if you need to make a tool for yourself, I wouldn't spend too much time on the first pass because you're always going to get the scope a little wrong. There's always going to be another little nugget you want to add or something that you put in that you don't actually need. It's great to have a quick version, an MVP or a minimum viable product just to figure out exactly what the scope is of what you need. And then after you really figure out what you want, then you can go and make the nice one. So that's now on my list is taking this, which works great. And now it has all the feature set that I want and makes a nice clean, full featured version when inevitably we need to make another one of these jigs to keep up. But anyway, I think the next video is probably gonna be about modifying the eight millimeter feeder to support 16 and 12 millimeter tape. And we're gonna have those coming out as soon as we can. It shouldn't be too much stuff on top of what eight already has. We're gonna use the same PCB. It's the same general structure. It'll use the same slot, all that kind of stuff. But that's the next thing we're tackling is getting the other feeder widths out. Well, anyway, that's it for this one. If you wanna check out the Lumen PMP and the feeders, you can go to opula.io to see everything that we have. You can also check out the source at this GitHub link. It's also linked in the description. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. First, let's switch to the big boy camera. Okay, that's better. It reminds me of the tweet about like computers feeling like a hack. The tweet is something like, if anything that you program feels like a hack, just remember that computers are rocks we tricked into thinking, but only after we trapped lightning inside of them. <laughs>